Hi, welcome to the Open Security Summit session in July 2022. This one is actually a very personal one to me because I want to talk about uh, how and why worldly maps change how I think. So I, I talk a lot about worldly maps. You probably see some of the stuff I do, you, you hear it. And actually, I'm doing a lot of recruitment at the moment, and I actually ask a lot of the candidates to do worldly maps. So uh, this is also one for them. And I really want to expand on why worldly maps really change how I think. And I would say that worldly maps is one of the best things I've learned in the last uh, four or five years. So, you know, this session is fundamentally, you know, so that I can uh, really sort of try to think about why worldly maps is so important and why it made a massive difference to me. Like I said, the target audience is a lot of the people that I talk about worldly maps. And then they go, why is that important? Why does that make a difference? Why is it so interesting? Why is it so relevant? So it's not necessarily one for beginners of worldly maps because I'm gonna you know, go through a lot of material, but definitely if you look at worldly maps and you still go, what the hell, why is this important? You might got some interesting things here for you. So I will blame Tony Richards on this. It's all Tony Richards fault because he's the first one who introduced me to Worldly Maps and he's the first one who actually managed to get Simon Worley to one of the Open Security Summits. So I remember the first time that Tony talked to me about his cell-based structure and he had these amazing concepts on it, on pioneer setters and town planners, structure, evolution. And I was like, where do you got this stuff? It's like, oh, that's not mine, that's Worldly Maps. And then I was like, what is Worldly Maps? So, and then I really got into it and I was, you know, massively, of course, into the maps. And then what was really cool was that we were able to get Simon Worley to the uh, Open Security Summit that we did in person in 2018. That was freaking awesome. So Simon came along and you could see we did a whole bunch of sessions in there. And then he also came along for the 2019 edition. This was even more awesome. We even have more sessions about Worldly Maps. We have you know, almost an insane intersection between the mapping crowd and the threat modeling crowd. This was really a massive pinnacle. And we were about to do the same thing in 2020, but then we had a small matter of a global pandemic. So we actually did it online. And we also have a huge amount of sessions, including some with Simon. And the interesting thing about these sessions is they actually got recorded. So which it's, it's so in a way we didn't do the on-site one, but we actually did the, the virtual ones and they all got recorded. And I wish I actually had the recordings of all the on-site ones. So the first thing I also did when I got into Worldly Maps, I saw Simon's presentation. There's kind of two, there's the crossing the river by filling the stones, which is the, the one I think he did quite originally. And there's also like this, this one even from 2014, uh, introduction to value changing Worldly Maps. Now, Simon does reuse a lot of his materials. So once you see one or two or three uh, in depth, you, you get a sense, but it is worth watching uh, a lot of them, right? Um, I also then did presentation about early maps because the best way to learn something is to present. So, you know, this was me, um, you know, doing a, a number of presentations on this topic. And I'm, I was able to pick Simon's brain, especially on the 2019 and, and uh, 2020 uh, summit, because we did a whole bunch of sessions where Simon was there. So it was really cool. So this is one I highly recommend that he did in 2020. And this is one we also did we are more you know, collaborative on culture. And there's others where we also talk about teams topologies and we talk about um, doctrine and stuff like that. So I highly recommend you to go through the, the 2020 summit sessions or worldly maps. There's, there's the website, you can follow from here and then you can see all the sessions. So let's look at my journey onto worldly mapping. So here was my first map, you know, which I basically did oops, on the board and I, and, I, and I tweet about it, which is also important. Because you know, sometimes you know, and I, I again, I use Twitter as my personal search engine, so I can go back and find things that are interesting. And uh, and this was a, a worldly maps where uh, you know it was I was really trying to think about the whole genesis, uh, you know, um, custom build product commodity, and we started to map the things, start to think about the value chaining of what we do. So that was that that was really cool uh, thinking. Uh, then I sort of, as I go into the maps, I really learn about evolution, which is the genesis, custom build product, uh, and and community, and and that's kind of the, the bit, right? And even Simon says that the most important thing is is the the evolution chain, which is the horizontal one, where the vertical one is more about, you know, he talks about value chain and visible, invisible, but that doesn't is not that relevant. It's that is more about this has a relationship with this, with this, with this. It's usually this 
uses this, or this needs this, and it's this, and it's this, and it's this, or, or there's multiple levels of abstraction. So you, it, it's all about like, there's a direct relationship between the parent and the child relationship. And that's literally the map that, that you go through. So everybody tends to start with a cup of tea, which is a really cool example. So here's the cup of tea where you kind of map out the difference between what is a product and customer and a commodity. So, and what's very interesting about this is that even when you look at this map, it doesn't mean that this map represents a big problem. You know, part of the reason of the maps, it's about context, about understanding what's going on, about the, the, the situation awareness. So for example, this map could be a really good business if you are um, a custom tea shop. So for example, like if you are a shop that sells tea, and in fact, what you probably wanna say here is the biggest thing is probably that tea, if this was a custom shop that really, for example, had to have their custom kettles and another big thing about being quite sort of traditional and, and not almost like a, a freaking kettle, right? And, a, you know, that you can buy in, in, you know, in the shop and, and boil tea, then that would make sense. But you probably want to have the tea here also be custom built, right? Or be not something you buy from, you know, from, from, the, from the supermarket. But if you are, you know, a, a normal or a, a not very sort of, custom you know tea shop if you're a normal you know let's say uh coffee shop then you don't want to have your custom built kettles why why would you have a kettle that costs a lot and custom build when you can literally just buy one um for you and that's really the power here the power is that once you see a map you can discuss the assumptions you can just discuss why things are in whatever they do and then you can do a huge amount of stuff in, in, in them to really understand, you know, how it goes. So for example, should staff be a product? You know, depends. And you know, if you just have almost treat your staff as disposable where you don't care, you get one, you get another one and you, you know, you basically are uh, almost productizing your staff, then yeah, it makes sense here. If you nurture them, if you really invest on it, if you kind of take the time to really create an amazing staff, then they're more custom built, right? They're more hard to replace. Because again, that's the definition. Now, I even play around with creative use of mapping. So I was doing some stuff with kids when I was writing that book. And, and I actually did this really cool trick because I would, I would get these kids who say, hey, you know, you should get into technology, you should get into, um, you know, basically the, 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 even the cybersecurity world. And some of them would say, yeah, but I, I don't do development. I don't do this. I don't, I don't do technology things. So I almost got them to say, okay, so why don't you map your, um, you know, your skills, right? And where you think you are in here. So I got them to say, well, look, say passion. You, you don't have, you don't know what it is. You, you have used it. You are good at it. You're expert. You have a lot of passion. And then maths and creativity, learning skill and organization, teamwork. And then I went for the stuff that was popular at the time, like Minecraft, Fortnite, Snapchat, Instagram, Raspberry Pi, and then, you know, the Python, the more technical stuff. So what's interesting is that a lot of kids would put a lot of this over here, right? You know, like some kids will go Minecraft, I'm an expert, Fortnite, you know, Instagram, right? And, and even passion stuff and creativity, maybe some of the maths will be a bit less, but most will say they're good at maths. And then, and then they'll go and say, oh, but I, I don't know Python, or I know a bit of Python, but I don't know Node.js or Linux, etc." And then I will go, look, when I look at the stuff that makes you hireable and that we want to hire in industry, you have all of it. You are good at it. You're expert. If you're good at Minecraft, you know how to build stuff. You have attention to detail. If you're good at Fortnite, you have teamwork. You know how to collaborate. You know how to strategize, right? So it was a really interesting way to to work. You know, kids with the so you know in a map, right? Kind of, right? And then and then you can create a strategy. You can say, look, okay, so you want to evolve this from there. So maybe you need to improve. You know, okay, so if you move your Python skills from there to there, which is something you can learn. You, you can now do other things. So it was a, a really, I thought it was, again, a big paradigm shift for me that, you know, when you can use it, you know, in things like this. And on that topic, let me walk you through 11, because it's always good to go to 11, for the ones who know the reference from SpinalTap, um, paradigm shift that I've done in worldly maps. And, and this is basically fundamental, this describes my journey. So the, the first one was that worldly maps are fundamentally graphs with context and, and and this is very big for me because as you could see up until i found worldly maps i was already doing lots of stuff around graphs i was talking about creating a graph-based secure organization uh you know making fact-based security decisions so i was really into graphs i have you know i, I think i've 
evolved my thinking throughout the years to really think about graphs and connectivity. And if you know some of the stuff I done with Jira, where I use Jira as a massive graph database, but even other things, I always think in relationships. And suddenly I realized that worldly maps is basically fundamentally a graph, but there's a lot more context. There's a lot more to it. So that was immediately you know, attracted to it. In a way, worldly maps created a, almost a philosophical uh, architecture that almost documented why a lot of things that have arrived by instinct actually made a lot of sense. And also gave me, of course, a lot of other scalability, which I'm gonna talk about later. So the, 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 the second paradigm shift was, you know, so I was really thinking in graphs, right? So, okay, cool, right? So, you know, that's fundamentally that. Then I go, was the evolution from a graph, you know, becoming a map? And then I really, really like, and this, again, the, when, I, when I saw this uh, assignment presented for the first time was like these light bulbs and paradigm shifts was this idea that a map is, is visual, has context, uh, has position where position matters, has an anchor, and you can describe movement and there's components, right? Now, you know, again, this is sort of Simon's definition, but I really like it, right? And, and you can see, right, in, in this kind of case, you got, you know, this, these graphs fundamentally here at the top are the same, right? Because they have the same relationships. They have the same nodes, they have the same edges, right? And in a graph position doesn't matter, right? But uh, in a way, these three maps at the bottom are different because map space and positioning has a meaning. And that's very important. So I see sometimes lots of strategy visual and, and, and presentations and diagrams and stuff like that. And, I, and they sometimes are graphs and you realize, and, and then everything becomes very clear because you go, wow, that is so missing a trick because it's not using space, but also other things that you can have you to throw context. You can do really amazing stuff with worldly maps in that, even that simple you know, structure. So yeah, so, so this was the second major paradigm shift was, you know, I was really thinking maps and then I started thinking, wow, I, I can now evolve into, so I was thinking in graphs, sorry. So I'm evolving that into thinking in maps, which was, was really cool. The other major massive paradigm shift that I did and really allow me to understand why a lot of things behave and, and operate the way they work is this concept really buried in the middle of the worldly maps called innovate, leverage and commoditize. And if you understand this, you understand why AWS has been beating everybody to the punches, why some companies are insanely successful and others are not. And some companies you know, don't fulfill their potential because they're not able to do this. And then fundamentally, the, the key concept here is that as things evolve from Genesis, custom build product and commodity, every time you hit a commodity, you allow a next generation of Genesis custom build product, et cetera. And then when that happens, you allow the next generation and then the next generation occurs, right? And, and, and this is insanely powerful because what then happens is that, you know, you can then use this to predict the future. You can use this to understand what's going on. So one of the really cool phrases that I remember Simon saying is that when things are at product layer, it's very hard to understand who will become a, a commodity or what, what will become a commodity. But you know that as soon as whatever that is becomes a commodity, then you're gonna have an explosion of activity at the upper tier. So you can already predict, you know, if you know that, okay, within the next couple of years, this particular product or something will become a commodity, you already can be playing in what's gonna happen next. And that's insanely powerful because that allows you to almost edge your bet to say, do you wanna be the one, actually it's almost like, can you be a player in going from product to commodity? Uh, and that's very dangerous because if you happen to be not the one that becomes a commodity, then you're gonna be eaten and you're gonna be, you know, basically be driving up the market. Um, or you can say, well, I'm gonna be playing the next one where I'm almost gonna leverage that commodity and and then play that space. So this world where you innovate, leverage and commoditize is insanely powerful. And if you look at the AWS strategy, it's all about the leverage. 
it's all about they do an innovation EC2 instance, and then they look around and going, wow, there's lots of people doing MySQL databases on top of EC2 instances, but they'll be doing on a custom build. It was not a product. If they basically install it from scratch, they have the cost and the pain to manage MySQL databases. So AWS comes along and go, hey, here's Aurora. Here's a MySQL database as a commodity. And, and they've done that you know, in just a normal full deployment configured. And eventually they've done that to even serverless, which is just an evolution of that. And, and some people will go, well, why would AWS basically disrupt their own cash cow there? Because clearly there's lots of people doing MySQL databases and it makes a lot of money for AWS to almost let them keep them badly managed. But AWS has been very clever because they go, yes, although you might lose some of those, not only, you know, A, you get immediate customers because those um, users will leverage the commodity, which basically means they will use a lot more, which basically means that, you know, you don't probably even lose any money there because your customers are now using more of it and you know what to do with it. It allows the next generation of customers to leverage it. So if you look at the evolution and the way, you know, you know why, why do you have an AWS base station for satellites, you know, freaking product? It's like, think you, what the hell? And you go, well, because surely AWS looked at who's using their world and realized there's a, there's a market there. So they leverage that and then they commoditize, which is insanely powerful, right? So again, when you look at, when you think like this and you look at a particular companies, you immediately understand why they've been successful, why not be successful, where's the gaps? And, and sometimes is you know, people put attrition in the middle. They, they create price points. They don't understand the power of users. They don't understand the power of commoditizing X and then leveraging you know, that to, to create the next value added that gives a lot of value to the customers. So uh, this was massive for me. The next one was thinking that the evolution is not just Genesis custom and product and commodity. So one of the things I, I did quite a lot was I play around with this. So you know, I, I'm a big fan on your graphs also have to, any maps in this case, they have to read in English. You have to give context. And, and the, in a way, the one, two, three, four stages of evolution um, are insanely powerful. So actually, to be honest, that, that probably should say not just activities. That's probably a better way because not just evolution implies that the one, yeah. So that, the better title for this would be not just activities. I'll fix that later. But you can see here that, you know, the, the, we, a lot of worldly maps talk about Genesis custom product and commodity, but actually that could be practices, novel, emerging, good and best, or data and model diversion, conversion and model, or knowledge, concept, hypothesis, theory accepted. So I was doing a project the other day and I was like, oh, I want to map a bunch of these. So I, I, I went back to some of the ones I've done and, and you can see that using that one, two, three, four, I mapped from openness, look from confidential, publish, CC, we know, and then CC Creative Commons. So CC by and CC Creative Commons. So you can see you go from completely confidential to completely open, right? Again, openness from proprietary to GPL to open source and public domain. And it's important to understand that GPL has a level of books. It's actually not as open as you might think because it's quite viral the way it does. Sometimes that's what you want, but clearly there's a reason why a lot of people went to open source and there's also the power of public domain, which has even less restrictions. And then like, look at security logs. I've, I've used this very effectively where, for example, in security, you map your, for example, detections or your third party SaaS systems that you have as, you know, do I have at least information? Do I even know what it is? Do I know what data is there? Do I know what logs I can get? Can I visualize them? And can I trigger events? So if you think about it, like if you have an incident in something that you only have information or not even that, you screwed, right? Because you have no visibility. By the end of it, you, you will start to have events. So you are proactive about it. So if you create a worldly maps with this evolution, you really understand where you should be focused, your attention. And again, for example, backup restore time take a system, can we even restore it? Sometimes, no, there's no ability to restore it. Maybe the backup is one week, maybe it's a day, maybe it's real time, i.e. by now we can do hot swap. So again, you're mapping the maturity of our backups. You know, what's your response time? Is it in weeks? Is it days? Is it hours? Is it minutes? What's your risk from critical all the way to low? And, you know, and sometimes you, you might do the other round. You might want to have low in one end and critical in the other. The point is that there is an anchor. So there is a Alleged there's context here. So, um, and also, for example, the attacker motivation is the optimistic, commercial, ideology, nation state. If you map, for example, your vulnerabilities connected to 
what is the motivation to exploit those vulnerabilities, you realize that, hold on, if I have a lot of vulnerabilities, but only a nation state will exploit it, then why should I care about them? So in this case, you might actually even turn, turn the map around. But, and then I go, hold on, if I have a, 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 even mid-level vulnerabilities, but they can be exploited by an opportunistic attacker, that might be way more dangerous than these big boys here that they feel very hairy and dangerous, but actually you need to be a nation state to really do something with it. So again, concepts, ideas, and data. You know, I, I have a little version of data where I actually go, data can go from unstructured to a spreadsheet, which is a way that data, to a graph, to a map, right? So and I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of not using spreadsheets, make the graph and then evolve it to a map. So the other massive paradigm shift I've done that I have with this is the pioneer settlers and town planners. And, and this is more, it, it probably says one genius thing of the whole worldly maps is this. And it's so true, right? This, this not taking into account pioneer settlers and town planners, I think is the reason why a lot of things fail. A lot of teams fail, a lot of projects fail, a lot of you know, developments fail because we mix things. We don't understand when you're doing something and you, you're building something that you should be buying, you're buying something that you actually should be building. And in a way, there's, there's a really cool sort of world that involves in your head when you start thinking, what am what are we doing? Are we, are we on this sort of chaotic phase? Are we doing pioneer stuff? Are we, you know, in a way failure is, should be rewarded. Failure should be encouraged. You wanna see lots of failure in the pioneers because it means you're trying all sorts of different things and eventually it works. And it works and it's kind of just about there, but then you need to give it to the next crowd, which is literally a different personality. They're also brilliant, but they're really good at taking those initial ideas and kind of productizing it. They, they map it out, they improve it, they, they do continuous improvement on it. They do all this kind of sort of heavy lifting to make it usable, repeatable by customers. And you package it and you can go. And then once you, you've done that and you have multiple products, eventually you need the town planners, which is another brilliant set of individuals who really talk about operation efficiency, which is about failure in non-option. It has to always work. It has to be super smooth. In fact, you almost have to become invisible to the user because it's just there. And then you have this evolution in this case. So even talk about, you know, maybe you have a, a chief pioneer, a chief settler, a chief town planner, where you, you could see that you create teams that sometimes start. So if you do this, it's gonna be a, a massive issue, right? So, um, uh, and so actually it's much better to say, look, you got a, a team here. And then what happens is, you know, in this case, you have a team of pioneers and then eventually the pioneers leave because you get the settlers in there. And eventually you've got the, and so the, he calls it the, the system of tests, which is one takes from the other, which is actually so true because sometimes the pioneers and the settlers want to hold on a bit more, but it's very important that one takes from the other and then there's a little transition period and eventually you have a team of settlers, um, which is really cool. So then this leads us to this idea that you, and which is one of the doctrines too, is that you use appropriate methods. So Agile is very strong in the Genesis phase, in the custom phase, because Agile is all about, you know, strong iterations, very fast experimentations, you know, sometimes not even have, you know, a good understanding of where you're going, you just want to evolve into it. Then as you go into the sort of the, the, the second and third stage, the custom and product, things like lean, you know, evolution, keep improving, buying off the shelf it is much more relevant, right? And then as you arrive into the commodity, it's about Six Sigma, right? It's about no variation. It's about high quality. It's about insane, you know, sort of um, solidity. You don't want failure, right? Like, you know, at the commodity level, you know, you don't want freaking experimentations, right? You don't want people, you know, when, you know, when you have something that's always supposed to work, be figuring out, oh yeah, let's just, Let's just do an experiment to see how we can build that more efficiently. No, you you bring it back, you evolve from this from the genesis all the way to stage four, right? And uh, and that that's also very powerful because you really need to use the appropriate methods for the particular section. Then you get these climatic patterns, which is really really cool. Which is this idea that you map sort of where where you are, right? The and this is the thing. So that when you start to map your ecosystem, these are the things that affect your world. 
So in a way, it's about this is like weather patterns, which is even here. Like you, you a lot of times you don't have control over this. This just happens. What you want to do is make sure that you understand it, so that you are um, you 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 almost understand the weather that is happening. So I really like this. It's like there's these weather patterns, there's these climatic patterns that will impact your world, impact your your map, and then if you ignore them, right, you you have blind spots. Uh, into it. Then there's the doctrine element, which is, in a way, the things you can do, the things that you can actually implement, get better at, and these even even map by the, the three different phases of, you know, like things like know your users, right? Have a systematic method of learning, focus on high situation awareness, uh, use the maps, right? Use a common language, challenge assumptions, focus on user needs, remove bias and duplication, think small and use appropriate methods. Again, on the thing. This is amazing. Like, and you should be measuring yourself against this. Then you understand what you're doing well, what you're doing, doing well. And it's it's amazing pattern. Like a team that behaves like this is pretty awesome. And then this also allows us to understand what gaps you have, what areas you want to do better, even what your competitors are doing. If you are really bad at this, but your competitors are worse, you're in a good place. But if you are bad at some of these and your competitors are better, then you have a massive issue because they're going to accelerate past you. And the, and the final one is gameplay, right? It's like, this is where it gets even better. So then, you know, you got the next level, which is there's some really cool, almost like plays that you can, you can basically do, you know, like, it's almost like patterns. You can, you know, strategize, you can do open, you can exploit network effects, you can cooperate, you can, you know, do all sorts of things, you know, threat and dump, you know, um, you know, last man standing. So these are almost like strategies that you can then understand. And when you're playing the game, you know, when you're playing, you know, basically you're executing a strategy, you should know this. You should know what you're doing and more importantly, what your competitors are doing. Because if somebody's playing a game of chess and you don't even understand that you're playing a game of chess, then you don't have a lot of choice. You're gonna lose or you're gonna, you know, not, not fulfill uh, your, your objectives. And so the, the last couple are, are, are just, I think a combination of all this where I would say, the worldly maps really allows me to predict the future. More and more I'm having this Zen of understanding why things occur, how they will happen, and how to predict what will happen next, and how to be more strategic about what, what actions you do, where do you focus, where should, should you be really leveraging your energy and your time, and, and that's very important because it gives you this sense of where things are going. And then finally, it gives me this inner peace. It allows me to understand why things happen. And it's important because even when things don't go your way, even when you have to compromise, even when you have to go on some detours or hit some roadblocks, the more you understand why that happened, the more you can have a very clear understanding of why things are occurring in the way and what you can do about it and what, what is your influence and what is things come from the outside world, I think the more inner peace you have because you, you understand what's going on. So there you go. So those are my 11 paradigm shifts, why worldly maps really change how I think and why I think it's super important and why I encourage anybody to spend time learning about it. And even if you don't draw maps every day, eventually you'll be, you know, if you're thinking maps, you are way more strategic. And I think a lot of people that interact with me, hopefully this allows them to understand a lot better how I operate. And also if you're applying for some of the roles we're hiring, you should see why it's so important that you learn about maps because you know this is definitely something that me and my team you know we should be talking every day about it and we should be thinking and strategizing in this way so thanks for watching and uh, and please provide some feedback and i'll see you in the next session